So, thank you very much, Alice, for the uh, introduction. My name is Martin Schlitz. I'm from Zurich, Switzerland. I work at a small company called Archaeologic. Uh, this is what we're doing. This is happens in a browser. So basically, we give you a way to digitalize your floor plans or build 3D models of furniture or real estate um, and then represent that interactively in the browser. You can refurnish these models, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it works in VR and AR as well and all from your browser. That's why I'm here to talk to you about WebVR. So I'm the head of engineering at Archaeologic. Um, I'm also a which is fine because I'm German and I can just yell, it's okay. I'm a Google developer expert for web technologies, um, do a lot of stuff with Polymer, or actually have been doing a lot of stuff with Polymer in the past, not doing that much anymore. I work with the web standards community at the W3C, which you all should know and actually participate in because the specs are not getting better when developers are not talking to other people. And um, yeah, I am at an Angular conference. So... What does this talk have to do with Angular? Are you even doing Angular, Martin? Are you using Angular, Martin? To which I say, look at that cute bunny! Oh my god, it, ah, I want to hug it so much. Anyway, moving on. Um, this is the boring part of the talk where I have to introduce like all the background and stuff and all the things that you have to tell your boss to make them allow you to actually do some VR stuff. So while this is boring, I'm actually going to unboring it a little bit by uh, onesieing up my game here. So bear with me. I should have some music playing, but you know, I, I only had that idea right now. It's like, hey, yeah, it's like reverse striptease kind of thing going on here. Um, so yeah, VR is actually not a new thing. It has started in like 1960-something, the first um, uh, yeah, experiments in academia. But it hasn't really made its way to Jesus, this microphone is annoying, so I'm going to turn it off and just yell. Yeah. Um, yeah. Please, actually, please no. No? Then I can have to be But mom, <laughs> I just want to yell to people. All right, so no yelling, so it's going to be... Um, that cuts out randomly, which is fine. It's completely not annoying or something. Um, yeah, so uh, it made its way into commercial space around the 90s. Uh, didn't go so well, <laughs> but then it became a, a renaissance of VR when um, the Kickstarter from Oculus was super successful and Facebook bought Oculus for two billion dollars. So uh, we now have VR coming back and it's actually larger than ever before and with AR around the corner as well, that's not going to get, you know, less. Um, and it's quite cool because it allows us to actually in, uh, completely Immerse the user, like I'm immersing myself into this onesie, into the experiences that we are building. So let's quickly, you know, go through a few of the various um, abbreviations you might hear. Because there's a lot of abbreviations because we love acronyms, right? So we might have all heard about VR, it's virtual reality. And then there's AR as well. And these two are sometimes by some people seen as exclusionary, like... Martin, do you think AR or VR will be successful? It's like, Martin, will be apples or bananas be successful? It's like, no, that's not the right question. Obviously, it's going to be apples. But um, actually, they, they complement each other. They are not the same, but they work together side by side. And all of this is encompassed as mixed reality or yeah, extended reality. So when you hear XR, people are talking about VR and AR more or less at the same time. Um, when they talk about VR, they mean virtual reality. When they talk about AR, they mean augmented reality. XR and MR are very, very, very marketing-y uh, um, acronyms. So what are the differences between VR and AR? Because these are the biggest. Things. Well, the difference is in VR, you take your user somewhere else, right? You're in a room and then you put some goggles on and then you're on top of a mountain or under the sea or on a plane or I don't know, somewhere in a fantasy world that doesn't even exist. Um, so it's like a teleporter. It takes your users somewhere else. Whereas AR brings information that I'm not having by using my natural senses or my natural surroundings into my current situation, into my current context. So it augments my reality, it brings something to me. It's like X-ray goggles, it, it surfaces information that is relevant to my current 
you know, context, my current um, whereabouts, my current reality uh, that I can't just perceive normally. For instance, it could tell you, um, I don't know, the usernames of all these people that are here or which band they favor. Uh, it's totally going to be Backstreet Boys, I guess. Um, there's a bunch of use cases for mixed reality, and I say mixed reality now because that applies to both VR and AR, education being one of them. I can take a school class to ancient Rome, which is relatively hard because time travel is still pretty expensive these days. Um, I can also use AR for that. I can have a school book that has a picture, and then I can hold my phone over it, and then it shows me an, a video or some, some interactive um, three-dimensional addition to what I have in the book. I can do that in healthcare, both for training surgeons or training medical staff, as well as treating patients. So treating uh, fear of flying is relatively expensive because you have to at some point sit them in the plane. But VR really, really tricks the brain of people into believing they're in a certain situation when they're not. So we can use that to basically put a certain situation that we have to put them into for therapy, um, and they believe that they are in this situation. It works quite well. We can also use it for tourism. Um, if I want to show you something, or if you know, I want to show you something before you even travel there, then I can do that. It ties into marketing a bit because I can say, like, look at the beach, isn't it awesome? And in VR, that makes a much, much stronger uh, impact or, or uh, uh, impression than pictures or videos would ever do. As I said, that ties into marketing. I can also show you products. I can also show you additional content. If I have uh, um, a display app somewhere in the tube, for instance, and I, I use AR, then the person holding their phone in front of it might get some personalized content on top of it. Um, so it's quite useful for that as well. Real estate and architecture make perfect sense because our, we live in the three-dimensional world, right? We don't live in, in a two-dimensional world like a screen is. So when we want to express spaces, spatial data, um, then 3D is a perfect medium for that, and VR makes perfect sense. AR makes perfect sense as well. If I want to see if a couch fits into my living room, and I can just hold up my phone and say, like, this couch, and then it, it looks like it is standing there, I can say, yes, this looks good, or no, this does not look as good. And it's easier than actually moving furniture around. Just imagine that, like, you buy something online, and then someone goes, oh, here's a couch, all right. And then you go, like, nope, nope, swipe right. Uh, that's not going to work well. Uh, arts and entertainment, we have a completely new medium that we have not even started to explore. So we can uh, consider, like, how do we bring theater plays into people's living rooms? How can we tell stories in a three-dimensional, immersive way? How can we make art that is interactive um, and uses virtual reality or augmented reality? So there's a lot of, of things to explore. So we've got a bunch of use cases. Uh, okay, now let's, let's go th quickly through the landscape. There's a few devices that you can uh, use these days for VR. We have the HTC Vive that is like the top of the line thing together with the Oculus Rift uh, and the Samsung Odyssey, I think. Um, it's a little costly. You need a computer for that. That also powers it. It needs to be like a gaming PC, so that's another like 600 bucks on top of it. So that's quite expensive, but you get room tracking so you can move around in the room and the VR system knows that you did that, that we moved around, pretty cool. Uh, we have the mobile version of that, you need a Samsung phone for the Gear VR, uh, and the Gear VR is a little cheaper, but you know, you still have to have a smartphone that supports it, so my smartphone is not a Samsung phone, eh, not for me, um, but it's quite cool, uh, it allows me to do that wherever I go, um, I don't have to have a computer, I don't have to tether it to a computer, but it also doesn't know where in the room I am. It knows which direction I'm looking at, but if I take a step to the side, the phone does not know that because it doesn't have the necessary sensors. Yes, the gyroscope, hypothetically, but it's too inaccurate to actually do that nicely. Uh, and then we have this, which was Google's answer to the Oculus. So Oculus, Facebook bought Oculus for $2 billion, and then Google was like, how about we take a cardboard and put a phone in? Isn't that cool? Yes, it is. And you actually, this is like the high price point because you can get them cheaper if you buy them in China. So I only have the numbers for 2016. This is where the business people go like, oh, yeah, charts and stuff. Uh, so I'll just quickly run over. Here in 2016, we, we see a few devices being sold. Um, Daydream just came out in the, whoops, uh, Daydream came out in the last quarter, so we are not actually comparing, we're comparing apples to oranges, really, because this is whole year sales, and this as well, and this one is basically just like one quarter. Um, but we see that the, the mobile market, the Gear VR, seems to be much, much larger than the high-end market 
in the desktop area, at least in 2016, that was the case. It's shifting now, but it's very, very slowly shifting. And there's one contender missing. The cardboard is missing because it does change the graph a little bit. So we have approximately 3 million devices, and then we have 82 million cardboards, 82 million by 2016. A little disproportionate. So the, basically, cardboard is like the minimal VR experience. It is the absolute low-end experience, yet it is what is most widely available to users. And uh, that brings me to, huh, but how could I build something that works for the people with the high-end devices and for the low-end devices? And if you have heard the term responsive design, who here has heard that? A few people, at least. That's very good. If you haven't heard that, definitely Google it. You are up for a big surprise. Because the web does work on your phone, right? So if I ask someone, who here does have a Windows computer? A Mac computer? A Linux computer? An iPhone? An Android phone that runs the latest version of Android? An Android version? Any Android phones? Who here has a web browser? Yeah, that's mostly people. There's one person in the back going like, no, I'm not going to do these games. <laughs> and that's OK. That's fine. But I'm pretty sure everyone has a web browser available. So that means that everyone who has a web browser available can display our content. Unlike if I build for the Oculus. Who here has an Oculus Rift? Wow. So my experience would work for one person in the room. Isn't that amazing? No, it's not. If you have a web browser, the things I'm going to show you today are working for you. That's pretty cool. Um, quick technology discussion, WebVR itself does not render 3D content. It does not. That's for some other technologies. And in this particular case, we're going to use WebGL because it is the most performant way of getting uh, 3D content on the web. So WebGL renders 3D graphics, and WebVR gives us the access to the headset hardware. It gives us the uh, request animation frame that runs with the native refresh rate because browsers normally run around 60 frames per second. But VR headsets sometimes run 120 frames per second. To get that and to get as many frames on the headset as possible, we have the WebVR uh, Web API that does exactly that. It also gives us access to the position and orientation. Position is not always available. The cardboard doesn't know where in the room I am. So it doesn't have this information. But uh, even the cardboard knows in which direction I'm looking. So we want that because we want to turn the camera in our VR app to see what the user is looking at. Also gives us access to the controllers that come with some of the hardware. Not all hardware has uh, additional controllers. The cardboard does not have any controllers. Um, but the Daydream has, and the Gear VR, and the Oculus Rift, and the HTC Vive, and all the Windows Mixed Reality headsets as well. So that's what the WebVR API does. It does not render 3D content. OK. It works on many, many platforms uh, and various browsers. The weird one out is uh, um, Oculus Carmel. Ignore that. That's Samsung Internet here. Yes, Edge. Um, yes, Edge. And it has Firefox and Firefox Nightly and Chrome on Android. And, uh, and even Rust has WebVR implementations ready. This is how you get started. No, just kidding. Uh, forget that. Um, Let's see how we can get started, because now this is the interesting part. And it's actually getting pretty warm, so I'm going to take down, I decapitate my unicorn here. Um, so let's start with a very exciting website. Uh, I built this amazing single page app. Uh, it's a progressive web app, and uh, it's quite cool. It's using no frameworks, so that's, that's quite cool as well. I do load a JavaScript library, though, because I want to do something interesting. So first things first, let's get that out of the way. So if I want to build a web VR application um, that is responsive, then I can use a library that is called A-Frame. It's a Mozilla project. It's open source, uh, has a super active community, and lots of lots of resources in the community that help you get going and build more complex things as well. Um, it is more or less like making a movie. So we need a stage, which is called a scene. It's an empty place where our things are happening. Our virtual world is in. Um, we need a camera and we need a light. Now, A-Frame goes, hmm, well, if the user forgets to create a light and a camera, I'm just going to do that automatically. So we don't have to worry about that. You can, if you really want to, if you want to customize the camera and the lighting situation, you can do that. You don't have to do that. Uh, A-Frame gives you automatic camera and lighting, which is nice. So now we have this empty space. That's not very exciting. Let's put something in there. Um, 
Things in ang uh, in uh, uh, I cannot type. Things in A-frame are called A entities. A entities are basically, yeah, objects. Now, objects it themselves do not look like anything. They are just invisible objects that are floating somewhere in space. So we want to add something. And now what we do is we add components. That's a term that web developers hopefully these days know. So what kind of components do we have? Well, we have a geometry component. The geometry component gives us a shape. So the, not necessarily the appearance, but this is becoming a shape. And I want to pick from one of the primitives that it has built in. And I start with a box, not because it's very exciting, but you know, it does its trick. Another component is a position. Position moves things around in space. And we have three dimensions now. So we have the x-axis as left to right, we have the y-axis up and down, and we have the z-axis. Positive values come out of the screen, negative values go into the screen. By default, the camera is at 0, 0, 0 and looks into the screen. So what we have to do is we have to move our object into the screen, and this is by meters. So I'm not going to move it left to right, I'm not going to move it up or down, I'm just going to move it two meters into the screen. That's why it's minus two. If it would be plus two, it would come out of the screen. Camera looks into the screen, then the box is behind us. Not very smart. Okay, um, let's try that. Whoop. Ta-da, we have a very exciting black box. And you see that, that A-frame already does a little more than, than just, just that, right? So we, I, can, I can look around using my mouse, because I'm not having a VR device here. Uh, I can go full screen, which is not very exciting, because it's going to yeah, it's a brown box on black background on this particular projector that's going to be particularly good. Um, and I can also use WASD to move around the box, so I actually get to move. But Martin, you said the camera is at zero, zero, zero. Yes, but the camera is technically like a person, because in VR we are mostly a person, unless you identify as a dog, which is okay as well, or a cat for that matter. I'm more a cat person, really. Um, so our eyes are not in the feet, they're not on the floor. The zero, zero, zero is here, it's on the ground. So A-Frame doesn't know, on the, this computer doesn't know how tall I am and it can't just prompt me like, Chrome would have access, would like to have access to your height. And you're like, what? The web height API. Um, so it basically just goes like, one meter 60 sounds about right. So we are basically one meter 60 high. If I would put on a headset that actually tracks my height and my position in the room, like the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift or the Samsung Odyssey or any of the Windows Mixed Reality headsets, it would actually be as high as I am. And if I uh, then like, like go down onto my knees, then actually it, it would follow me as well. So this can't do it because we don't have a VR headset here. So it automatically assumes 1 meter 60 and I can prove that by moving the box up by 1 meter 60 and then it's on eye level. Oh, it changed color. My, how did that happen? Because we gave it a geometry, so a shape, but we didn't give it any material, right? Because we know in the real world, this, this table is made from wood. This is made from, I don't know what exactly it is made from. There's some concrete over there and so on and so forth. So there's another component for that called material. So we do material equals color red. Let's see how well the projector copes with red. I've had a few projectors that can't display red. Yeah, thanks daylight. Um, this is supposed to be red. We can change it for green. Nope, that was the wrong button. That's okay as well. We can change that for green. It's probably easier to spot that this is green. No, it's too dark. Okay, whatever. Trust me on my screen, it is green. Um, I, can, I can do that. That's great. I can also change this for, let's say, a sphere, and then we get a sphere. So if I walk around that, then it, you know, that's a sphere. Great. Um, it is a little annoying to explore that in code, so conveniently, A-Frame comes with developer tools built in. If I press a special key combination, I get the, the, the daylight is really annoying because it completely screws the contrast, but I get this wonderful thing, and I'm actually gonna, gonna show you what you can do here. Um, I can, for instance, go and change the material to, let's say, white. Whoops. Ta-da. So now we have this a little easier to spot. Um, I can also move it around here. I can move it like this, and I can move it down, and I can move it over here. And if I now go back, oh shit, my background is white as well, so that wasn't necessarily the smartest move I pulled. So let's pick like a bluish tone. Then yes, it has moved, right? So I can change everything of the scene in here 
in a very visual way. Okay, now rotating a sphere does not make that much sense. So let's change that to something else. Let's change that to the, whoops, uh, to the torus knot, for instance. So now we have this, I call it the pile of poop of 3D, but um, it's a pretzel. Yeah, definitely a pretzel. Um, I, can, I can rotate that here, so I can do like this, and then maybe like that. And then, hey, look at that. We got it rotated, and I can rotate it around like this as well. And then it has rotated in my scene. I can also scale it. I can scale it in this direction. I can scale it in that direction. I can also scale it like this, and maybe like that. And then I get my shape scaled. So I have full flexibility here. I can also add new things. Um, as you see, like, this is another object here, but it's invisible because it doesn't have any components. So I do the same thing here visually. I add a component, the geometry component, and then I get an additional box. It's relatively easy. I can export everything uh, into my editor like this, so I can basically just go copy this scene, and then I can go, okay, now I have the scene copied, so I want to use that. Boom. Oh, it actually gives you the entire HTML. That was not very nice. Um, nope, I don't need a body. No, I don't. No, no, no. Okay. And if I reload, I get the more or less the same result. The color has changed because I haven't picked a material for this box yet. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes like, huh, they haven't specified anything, but they want to see something, so I'm just going to pick some random color for you to see something. Um, we also get the opportunity to use actual 3D models. So there's a bunch of formats out there. Um, there's OBJ, which pretty much every 3D program knows. There's FBX, which half of the 3D programs know. Uh, and then there's GLTF. GLTF is relatively new, but it is like optimized for web um, usage. So I highly recommend to use uh, GLTF, which stands for GL Transfer Format. I'm like, why don't you call it Web GL Transfer Format? Because then the, yeah, whatever. WTF would be the file extension, but no one's listening to me anyway. Um, so we do the same thing. We add an entity. I position it somewhere. Let's say I position it at 0, 0, minus 3. I don't know, minus, so 3 meters into the screen. It goes, and I want to load something from a GLTF file. And I can by just spe specifying the file that I want to load, and I'm going to go for cesium man. Uh, it's a binary file. In this case, as binary files tend to be smaller, Ah, it's not very easy to see, is it? So let's, let's try something else. One more thing. There, there's shorthand versions as well. So you can, for instance, have a sky that basically just gives you, I'm very creative with the color, I just go sky blue because it makes sense. Um, it gives you a gigantic sphere that is around your scene. So now we have a sky covering us. I could load an image on this. And here's the good thing. If you have a 360 degree camera, uh, which I happen to have with me, so if you want to take a 360 degree selfie, just let me know. Um, I can actually, instead of loading a color, I can load a 360-degree image. And I think it is called Stage JPEG, but I'm not sure. Let me actually double check if that is true. Yeah, it's called Stage JPEG. So I took a picture on another conference where I was on stage, and here we are. Hi, that's me. Uh, and this is very early in the morning before the conference starts on the stage. So if you ever want to know how it is to be on stage in Singapore at JSConf Asia, this is how it feels like. And if I would now have a 3D, uh, sorry, VR headset with me, I actually do, um, I could look at it in VR and I could look around uh, and enjoy it, which is nice. Now, okay, this is a little, just why do I click on settings? I really, really want to change settings, apparently, uh, in my subconsciousness. So here we have this little guy that is a 3D model that is a sample model. It's called the Cesium Man because this is a model done by a company called Cesium. Um, I can animate things as well. No, not the sky. The sky is a bit pointless because it's just a plain color, so that's not really useful. Um, I can animate this. For instance, I can say I want to animate its rotation, and I want it to go to zero degrees around the x-axis. I want it to turn like this. So the y-axis is this, so I want it to turn 360 degrees around the y-axis, so I do that. And I want this to take 3,000 milliseconds, I want no easing, it doesn't, so by default it speeds up and speeds down, um, fade in, fade out, or whatever, ease in, ease out, whatever you want to call that, by accelerating and then decelerating, and I don't want that, I want that to be linear, and I want that to repeat indefinitely. Whoever wrote that thing that indefinitely is not easy for non-native English speakers to type. And then, hey, here we have it, it rotates around itself. 
that was um, not very hard to do. And now this is not really useful, really, because you know it doesn't look that good. But 3D models can also be actually animated. Uh, and to use the animations in the 3D model, I have to load an additional helper, which is in the A-frame extras. It's called the animation mixer, because this model has multiple animations. Um, and I can just add this. So this is not an A-frame component that is built into A-frame. But this is how you add A-frame components to a scene. You just put them in, you load the JavaScript, and then you put them in like that. So now I'm using the, A uh, the animations mixer. And here we have it. It juggles its head. A little bit and it moves and you know it has a good time that's amazing so this is how you use the animations in that model and now I want to quickly show you something that's a shameless plug really but um, if you want to deal with spaces with real spaces with a real environment you can easily do that I want to show you how first things first I'm gonna remove this uh, I'm loading a small library called uh, 3d.io which is what we provide you with and uh, that adds a few things to the development tools and gives you a bunch of components that you can use. So first things first, I jump into the uh, in built-in A-frame developer tools, and now we have an additional button here that says 3D.io. That wasn't there before. So now I can load that, and it gives me a selection um, of things. It gives me a furniture library, it gives me access to poly.google.com and staff picks. Poly.google.com is, there's tools for Google, from Google made in VR that allow you to create things in VR, like all sorts of models. So I can go here, and then I can Google for things, and then I get them. The problem is oftentimes the people making it don't know the scale. So for instance, sometimes you get a tree, and then it's like this towel, and you're like, yeah, uh, OK. Um, the nice thing about our library is, for instance, the furniture library, this is actual to scale. This is real furniture, and it is to scale. So if I search for sofa, I get a ton of them. And you could go into a store and buy these sofas. They actually exist. So I can get a sofa here, and I can move that around. I think that's a Vitra one. I don't know. And um, yeah, so there's a sofa now. And I can change the materials, because these sofas come in different materials as well. So I can change that. I can also programmatically change that. Everything that I can do here interactively, I can also do uh, actually in, in the um, in the APIs or using APIs in JavaScript. There's also the staff picks library, which is kind of nice. Uh, if you upload your own floor plan, it's not going to be in the staff picks, um, but you can access them in A-frame. But you can also just do like this. And then we are in a living room that you might recognize from a TV show. So this is the, the Big Bang Theory apartment, for instance. So we could piss off Sheldon by just standing right here, where he once usually sits. Anyway, so yeah. That is that, and I'll quickly, I'm running out of time, but basically what I wanted to say is the WebVR API is being renamed into the WebXR API because we also support um, uh, augmented reality now, and let's see if the internet is nice. So here in Zurich, a coworker of mine using our tools, that is in the browser, by the way, um, is basically just picking out the corners of the room. <sighs> plop, plop, and plop. So now we have picked all the corners in the room. And uh, we can say there's a door from here to there. And there's a door from here to there. And that's on a phone, right? That's on a regular Samsung phone that you can buy. Uh, it would also work on the Pixel 2. And then we can automatically furnish, because we built this API for you to use. So you can automatically furnish rooms, um, like a living room, for instance. This is sample furniture, but you can also put real furniture in. I'm just going to skip it based on time. If you want to learn more of A-Frame or actually get started properly in A-Frame, there's an interactive tutorial called the A-Frame School. Um, we have a sandbox that allows you to play around with stuff as well. Uh, I do make a video, like blog kind of thing, where I, where I talk about stuff and get guests in as well. We blog about this as well. And um, there's a, no, that's actually bullshit. Um, and definitely show me what you have built with this, because I like to see what people are coming up with, because there's so many amazing ideas, and you have ideas, I know that. So definitely, when you build something, uh, tweet at me. My Twitter handle is down there as well. And um, I just want you to leave with a in, like, super inspirational quote, but there's not that many inspirational quotes about VR, so I made one myself. Um, I'm quoting myself here. If the computer is a bicycle for our minds, which is what Steve Jobs said about the computer being the tool that augments our powers, VR is a teleporter, and that can take you anywhere. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Have a great time, and um, talk to me.